Hey friends, welcome to episode two of my past pandemics series, my pestilence project as we're calling it here in my house. I'm the only one calling it that. Last time we talked about the plague of Athens and today we're jumping ahead a few centuries to talk about the Antonine Plague. And yes, I will be doing that for every plague that I introduce now because it just seems to be the scary thing to do. So if you like it, if you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this weird plague movement. Maybe we can like bring it back onto the dance moves once we're allowed back in the clubs. Actually, if someone can name that dance move, something with plague, like a double P thing, that'd be amazing. I put that in the comments. We're going to start a whole movement here. But let's get back on track. Picture this with me, if you will. The year is 165 CE. The Roman Parthian Wars are coming to an end, and a pretty successful one at that if you're looking at the Roman side. The great philosopher Marcus Aurelius had just settled into his rule a few years before. He's great, he's the last of the five good emperors. Now that's a bad name right there. Five good emperors? Seems like things should be going pretty well for the Romans, right? Wrong. Little did Marky Mark know that a plague was coming for him and it would last the remainder of his reign. The final months of the year 165 CE saw the beginning of the end of the Roman Parthian Wars. Roman troops had just sacked the Mesopotamian city of Seleucia. It was a happy affair. For the Romans anyways, not the Seleucians. But Seleucia went and had the last laugh because they infected the Roman army with a plague. <laughs> I definitely need to work more on my cackling. There are two main legends on how the plague was released onto the Romans, and then there's the more likely story. The first story is that the Roman general and later co-emperor Lucius Verus went in and opened a closed tomb during the sacking of Seleucia, therefore releasing the disease onto the world. It's very Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, if you ask me. The second legend is that a Roman soldier went into the Temple of Apollo, opened a golden casket belonging to the god, and therefore allowed the plague to spread. That one is major Wrath of the Titans vibes. I like it. Both Lucius Ferris and Marcus Aurelius blame the outbreak on a violation or angering of a god, so those legends seem to have convinced them at least. Others of course blamed the Christians for making the quote, real gods angry. People always blame the minorities. We have to stop doing that fam. So those are the two legends. Now here's what probably actually happened. It's most likely that the plague began in Eastern Han, China, and then made its way along the Silk Route over to Mesopotamia. Seleucia is on the banks of the Tigris River, which is on said Silk Route, and that's how it got to the Romans. There are actual accounts of Roman soldiers suffering from it whilst still in the city. The ancient Romans, just like the rest of the world at the time, are still not 100% knowledgeable on how epidemics spread and also on how to identify diseases. So not only did the Roman troops bring back the spoils of war, they also brought the plague home with them and spread it across the entire Roman Empire. That's literally the worst souvenir that anyone could have brought back from their travels. Hey dad, what did you bring me? A cruel and painful death that will ravage the empire for the next 14 years. You're welcome. And remember, at the time, armies march. So they're spreading it across all of their states on their way back home, and it just went like wildfire. It was going from city to city across the entire empire. The plague hit Gaul, Egypt, the colonies along the Rhine, you name it. And the death toll? Five million people over 14 years. Five million! The Antonine Plague, named after Marcus Aurelius, whose full name is Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, did what no one else could do at the time. It almost broke the Roman Empire apart. Many scholars think of this plague as a starting point for the beginning of the decline and eventual fall of the Roman Empire. At the height of the epidemic, there were about 2,000 deaths per day all over the empire, with a mortality rate of about 25%. In total, around 7 to 10% of the entire empire died from this plague. Even the emperors might have died from it. Lucius Ferris died in 169 CE, and Marcus Aurelius died in 180 CE. And it's speculated that the plague got to them as well. No one is safe from pandemics, friends. So that being said, what were the symptoms, and can we identify what it was? The Antonine Plague stands out because it's the only epidemic that we have several eyewitness accounts for, as well as later sources. Of course, they're not perfect sources because the amount of information inside of them are very brief and sparse, and of course, there's still not as many as we would like, but we can still use them to try and get a picture of what the plague actually was. Galen, who is the most famous medical writer, was 
lucky enough to be living through the Antonine Plague, and he wrote all about it. He describes the symptoms as fever, diarrhea, an inflammation at the back of the throat, as well as skin eruption with the odd pus coming out of your body on the ninth day. The information here doesn't help us too much with identifying what the plague actually was, but it does help scholars to think that it was either smallpox or measles. Some molecular studies do place the emergence of measles around 500 CE, so let's go with smallpox, shall we? The sweeping nature of this plague hit the Roman Empire hard, and we're not just talking population numbers. The plague affected the military the most, and the army is said to have been all but wiped out. This called for some emergency recruiting and conscripting in order to keep fighting the Macromanic War. The death of so many taxpayers also meant a major economic decline. We can see in the records from Egypt just how much the economy was affected. Farming plots decreased in both size and rent, and because of the plague, a lot of Egyptians went back to nomadic life to try and sustain themselves that way. Documentation dropped dramatically as well this time, especially with military discharge certificates. Public building projects were also dropped by well over 50% in comparison to the previous emperor, Antoninus Pius, and building projects being financed by the emperor just stopped altogether, like statues, temples, everything just stopped. And of course, it also means then that people producing bricks and marble also saw a decline in their business and their economy. You can see how the domino effect happens. Then we can even talk about if you want the maritime trade throughout the Indian Ocean and the trade throughout Southeast Asia, which also took a huge nosedive. The plague caused majorly irreparable damage to Roman maritime trade. Culturally speaking, there were some other really interesting things happening as well. We had a really fun false prophet who shows up on the scene by the name of Alexander of Abonoteicus, who created a very long-lasting cult. Alexander of Abonoteicus was ridiculous, you guys. His entire cult of Glycon was founded on this appearance of a snake that had like a human head and a full mane of hair, which was essentially just a sock puppet. So if you guys want a video going more in depth into how crazy crazy Alex was, let me know in the comments below because I am more than happy to talk about this ridiculous cult. He came to Italy and had this whole anti-plague campaign. He had a really fun like verse or slogan too, which was Phoebus, the god unshorn, keepeth off plague's nebulous onset. This slogan was written over doorways all over the place trying to ward off the plague. The writer Lucian called out Alexander as a fraud in his writings, like he did not like him. Did not. A fun little anecdote about this slogan was that it seemed to have the opposite effect of what Alexander was going for. Most of the houses that had this phrase written above the doorway were pretty much depopulated. Sorry Alex, better luck next time. Finally, some scholars think that this plague brought about this new way of thinking, mostly due to the stoicism and writings of Marcus Aurelius in his work Meditations. He wrote things about the plague like, For the destruction of understanding is a pestilence, much more indeed than any such corruption and change of this atmosphere which surrounds us. For him, lack of understanding and lies were worse than any plague. Deep, Marcus. So there you have it, friends, the Antonine Plague. As vicious as it was, it did see a decline in the year 180, although it resurged again in the year 189. The Roman Empire never recovered from such a blow, but the world carried on, just like it always has. So there was episode two of my past pandemics series. If you liked the video, go ahead and give it a like down below, smash that like button, and while you're down there as well, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any more episodes of our past pandemic series. Big thanks again to all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you like the channel, if you wanna support it in a different way, go become a patron over on Patreon. The link to that is in my description below. You really get some cool behind the scenes access there. You get some free things, all that fun stuff. Go ahead and click that link to join that community. And as always, Stay dirty, my friends.